Welcome to Hope Shot. I'm so glad that you guys could join me today. I have a very good friend of mine, recovery coach and creator, Jamie Tall. Thank you so much for joining me today, Jamie. Thank you so much for letting me be here. I'm so excited to be on here and tell my story and um, just let everybody know the hope of recovery, that recovery is real and recovery is possible no matter what your situation. Yes, that's right. And we've done a lot of um, meetings together and a lot of videos together, but I've never got to hear you tell your story. So I'm super excited. I hope you're ready. <laughs> okay. Well, let's get, get ready, people. Get ready. There's no, we don't hold nothing back here. <laughs> well, let's get right into it. So tell us a little bit about, you know, where it all started. So I was um, born in Massachusetts. So I'm actually from New England. Um, and my family is from Sicily. And so growing up, my family had a lot of affiliations with the mob. And um, I saw a lot of things as a small child that small children shouldn't see. I heard a lot of conversations about things that happened and things that were going to happen that were pretty scary. Um, seeing people, you know, get beat, seen, <laughs> seen all kinds of crazy things. Um, and to me, it made me feel very unsafe. I also grew up with an alcoholic, violent father. Now, my father was wonderful. He was my superhero, right? He was like everything to me. Um, but it was like one of these situations where you never knew what you were going to come home to, right? Mm -hmm. Am I going to come home to my dad who is wants to have fun and watch scary movies and eat celery and cream cheese? Or am I going to come home to my dad who is, drunk and just beat up my mom right and smashed everything in our whole house um just a super violent temper it was always like walking on eggshells you know what I mean and as a small child and for me I do believe that I was born with the disease of addiction we mm -hmm. never feel safe mm -hmm. never feel safe never feel comfortable in our own skin and never feel like we can truly be ourselves or feel like we can receive love all the way. Right. For me, there was a lot of like unworthiness and self-hatred. Um, at a very young age, I was trying to control things that I could control because everything was so uncontrollable. Right. Um, it came out in different ways, like starving myself. I, I used to starve myself at five years old, right? Um, I had a very weird sex complex as a young child. Um, and I would try to be like sexy. I was like a seven-year-old, like trying to make myself look sexy. And I don't know where that came from, um, but I was very like sexually minded as a very young child. Um, and I have no idea like where that came from or how it, how that happened, but I just, I was, and I also had these, um, standards of perfectionism where, you know, I had to be like the best and the prettiest. I had to get the best grades. Um, everything was works based for me. Oh, my parents will, will love me if I get good grades. My parents will love me if I do the dishes, right? So it was a lot of work and a lot of trying to control things as a young child. And this is all under the age of 10. Wow. I can relate to a lot of that. I don't know where it came from for me either, but I remember like dressing up in high heels, putting on short shorts, walking around the neighborhood, like swinging my hips back and forth, you know, just being sexualized at a very young age. And, you know, also feeling like I didn't fit in my own skin. I can relate to that. So where did the addiction start for you? So my addiction actually started with escape. So mm. I, being that my father was, you know, who he was and <laughs> where, um, you know, he would get himself in some trouble. Sometimes we would have to move a lot. So I moved uh, 12 different times before I even got into high school. Wow. So every time I would move to a different place, I would become a different person. 
mm-hmm. because I was like, oh, well, they'll like me if I'm this person now. Now I'm going to move here and I'm going to be this person because that didn't work very well, you know? <laughs> um, so I was always trying to escape reality. I also read a lot. Like I used to read, um, this is probably way outdated for some people, but uh, Sweet Valley Twins, Babysitter's Club. Yes. <laughs> I would read literally like a whole book a day. And I started writing my own books in seventh grade, like just writing these these short stories of like this alternate universe that mm-hmm. I lived in where, where I wanted my life to be. And it was all very like, you know, teenagey romance kind of thing. And, you know, um, I was always loved and accepted and had a lot of friends in these <laughs> stories. Right. And that was like where I found my first true addiction, which was escape. Mm-hmm. After that, it moved into, diet pills, right? Um, I always struggle with my weight. I was a chubby kid growing up. I mean, already not being able to feel like I fit in already having all this crazy stuff going on in my house. And then I'm at school and the kids are making fun of me. Like this one year I was at this school and the whole class was making pig noises at me every single day. And I would go in the bathroom and I would just cry. And I would like beg God, like, please don't let them say anything bad to me. And they thought it was hilarious because I would have to leave the classroom in the bathroom and cry, you know? Um, And it went on for a whole year and it was so traumatizing to me. And in that I developed super body dysmorphia, eating Mm -hmm. disorders. Um, And so the first thing that I got addicted to was actually diet pills when Mm -hmm. I was 14 years old. And that was when they had the good diet pills. (laughs) I was thinking that too. They used to have, what was it? Ephedrine, right? Yes. (laughs) Yeah, yes. I did those too. <laughs> yes. So um, I, and I was, you know, like a really good kid. Like I got my first job at 15. Um, I did very well in school. I was super involved, student council, assembly committee. I was in theater, um, graduated with honors, um, very involved with my church, uh, service work. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I was like trying to, I was planning for my SATs when I was in like seventh grade. You know what I mean? Like I was very goal driven, very mm-hmm. book oriented, like trying to get to like the next goal, you know, had these dreams and aspirations. I always wanted to be like an independent businesswoman. That was like my thing. Um, And so all of that, you know, when I finally got into high school was when I actually made my first real friends Mm -hmm. and the place that I fell that I fit into (laughs) were the partiers. (laughs) (laughs) And I remember the first time that um, drugs and alcohol became my solution. Mm -hmm. I was at a party and I was feeling so self-conscious and I was like so nervous, so uncomfortable in my own skin because there was like the cool kids were at the party, right? And um, I remember being there and I started drinking and I remember it was those like like a a blue (laughs) boons. I'm really showing my age now. (laughs) Um, Those big, you know, 40 ounce Mm -hmm. boons. Um, And uh, it's just like smoking weed, just your regular high school stuff, right? Nothing major. But, um, you know, at that point, something clicked in my brain. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I was funny and I was charming and people liked me and I wasn't insecure anymore. And people wanted to talk to me and it was easy for me to look them in the eye and talk to them. And I thought to myself, wow, this is all that I needed this whole time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Drugs and alcohol. <laughs> what a great solution to all of my problems. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah. that's where it started. Yeah, I can relate to all of that. I mean, being in high school and find hanging out with the wrong crowd, right? The crowd that would accept me, the crowd that was easy to fit in with. And we were just having fun, I thought, you know, and but I believe I was an addict as well from the very beginning. And then having a drink or a drug when I was, you know, 13, 14 years old activated the disease inside of me. And it was like, I found what I've been missing all of these years. And I just never want to stop. Exactly. Exactly. It was, you know, 
And that's where it led to, you know, it progressed, of course, it was, but it was still, it was still fun then. It was still a mm-hmm. choice then, right? Like, oh, this weekend, we're all going to pile up over at, you know, Buddy's house and we're going to take a bunch of acid and we're going to watch Austin Powers and laugh and it's going to be fun, right? And so that's kind of like where it went. Um, my addiction also comes out in relationships. So mm-hmm. I have a, a, you know, a foundation of codependency. <laughs> so <laughs> feeling like, you know, I'm going to like die if somebody, if like a person leaves me, you know what I mean? So that that put me in a whole bunch of, you know, situations where I got rejected, you know, like mm-hmm. so badly got my heart broken so many times because I <clears throat> couldn't see situations for what they really were, you know what I mean? And thought like, oh, this person must really like me, you know, and ended up, you know, getting getting hurt so many times and, and kind of put me on this road to codependency, which led me to some really toxic relationships. Um, I was with this one guy who was an alcoholic for like a couple of years. Uh, and I wasn't, I was still like very like manageable in my drug use. You know what I mean? I was working, I was going to, to college, um, and working two waitressing jobs and wow. had my own apartment <laughs> be, being, you know, messed up all the time, but like, but it was still like manageable, you know, it was kind of like in like my rave scene on the weekends and, <laughs> you know, something like that. And I remember he, um, he would get so blackout drunk and I couldn't understand it. Like how, why don't you just stop drinking? You know what I mean? Like, how do you Mm -hmm. get that? Cause his disease was way more progressed than mine. Right. But I, I couldn't understand it. And I remember one time I woke up in the morning and he like walks in the front door. He's totally trashed. And I look outside and my car is not there. And I'm like, where's my car? And he's like, I have no idea. Oh no. (laughs) Crashing it like (laughs) on like somewhere. Oh my goodness. It was a mess. Um, you know what I mean? But I stayed with that guy for like so long, even though he was like, you know what I mean? Not somebody I should have been with because of mm-hmm. codependency issues and, you know, feeling like, like he was like my, my heir, like I had to be with him, you know? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I get that about the codependency too. Cause my story is like all my relationships in my younger days, like that was codependency. I just needed somebody to fill the void that was with inside of me. And I had also a drunk too, right? He would get this like look in his eyes and you knew when he was not in the right frame of mind because he was gone. Like his, eye, you could see into the soul and the soul was not there when he would pick up alcohol mm-hmm. and then he would bash shit and he mm. would crash his car, call me at two o'clock in the morning. Cause he's in a ditch again, you know, and actually like he didn't make it. He wound up passing away mm. to an overdose. Cause he took some pain pills one night when he was drinking and never woke up from that. So I, I get that about the relationships and the codependency. And so did you ever finish college? I did. (laughs) Uh, I actually went to college for 10 years, Um, but I went to school for everything. I was like a professional student. So (laughs) um, I ended up with an associate's degree in business science and psychology, Mm -hmm. but I also went to school for fashion design. I went to school for criminal justice. I went to school for aesthetics. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I, I went to school for marketing. Um, I I am about six credits short of a bachelor's degree in international business. Wow. Um, but because of my addiction, right? Like I could not finish anything, right? Like I'm like, oh, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm doing really good. You know what I mean? Like my favorite example is when I went to fashion design school, I actually went in Tampa, International Academy of Design in Tampa my dream forever was to be a fashion designer, like since I was a kid. Right. And, um, I was always like sketching and drawing outfits. And, um, so I go to this school and like, it turned out like my teacher kept giving me my homework back, like, "Mm, maybe you should try it again. You know what I mean? So it turns out that I suck at drawing and I can't sew a straight line. (laughs) So so I was like, okay, well let's try something else. Right. I was just searching, right. For something, for a purpose, for something. Right. Um, and I, I think that that's kind of like where my codependency and relationships came in. Cause it became like a purpose for me, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I got pregnant with my son and, um, you know, amazingly enough, I did pretty well. Like I quit using, I made a geographical change. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> I quit using and stayed sober through that pregnancy. Um, stayed sober for another year after that breastfeeding and and being mom, right? Like 
which I was like 20, uh, 24 years old then. And, but then, you know, I got this wonderful idea that, okay, well, I've, I've breastfed him for a year. I've been stay at home mom. I'm, you know, I want to have some fun. Right. So I get this part-time job at Applebee's and, uh, I'm working as a bar back and I'm working, you know, and I start, okay, well, I'm done breastfeeding. I just want to drink. I just want to have some drinks. So I'm not going to breastfeed anymore. I'm going to choose to drink instead. Okay. So, and it, the craziest thing happened. It was like, I picked up right where mm-hmm. I left off. It was so crazy. I mean, it didn't take long at all. It was like, mm-hmm. I was drinking again. I was um, doing cocaine and then I started smoking crack. And that's when things got crazy. Yeah. Me and baby daddy started smoking crack and he ended up having to go to jail for some something that happened like a couple years before. So I thought it would be a wonderful idea for me to give my son to my mom so mm-hmm. that while baby daddy was in jail, I could maintain the household and keep our apartment. So when he gets out, we can continue our family. He was only going to be gone for like four months or something, right? Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> I find out when he left that he he had not paid any of the bills for like three months. Oh no. (laughs) Like he had, cause we were smoking crack, but I thought we were still paying the bills. Right. I didn't know. (laughs) So I get like eviction letter. Um, your electricity is about to be shut off like all this. And I'm like, Oh crap. Um, so I have this wonderful idea that I'm going to go work in a strip club. Mm. I'm like, Oh, I'll just go do this and make money. You know, um, so I worked at Applebee's and I worked at the strip <laughs> club and, um, you know, was able to get caught up on money and da, da. And, you know, the craziest thing happened when I worked at the strip club, it was the first time that I actually thought that I was worthy of something. Yeah. I remember thinking to myself, well, if these guys are paying me to dance, I must be worth it something right Mm -hmm. so I'm finding my value here in in what you know these men think of me I'm finding my value in how much money they're giving me which only lasted you know I was I I think I danced for just a couple years because by the end of it I was so angry and frustrated and just hated men altogether Mm -hmm. um that you know what I mean I remember being on stage and this guy like handed me a dollar and I was like a fucking dollar. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, is that what you think I'm worth? And then I like turned around and kicked his beer over on his lap. (laughs) He's a nasty person. I was not like a nice person at all back then. Um, And so I ended up leaving that and just like, so I had built some relationships in, uh, mm-hmm. working at the strip club. Right. So I had like seven boyfriends, mm-hmm. boyfriends, okay? <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> uh, you know, one or two of which were senior citizens. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, um, this one guy was really cool though. He was like 60, 70 or something, but he was cool as hell. He drove this badass Corvette. You might even know him. We'll talk about that after. Okay. Sarasota. <laughs> I think um, I might know who you're talking about actually. Oh my God. <laughs> The red Corvette with the lady drip drawn on the front. <laughs> Girl, that was my boyfriend <laughs> for a really long time. Yeah, he was cool as hell. He was cool as hell. Um, he really helped me out though. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, between him and and the other, you know, seven um guys. Uh, you know, I was able to pay all my bills. I mean, I had my, my kid was pimped out in polo head to toe, you know, what I'm saying? <laughs> like I was able to make it. Um, and then I ended up, uh, meeting this guy from Chicago who I ended up falling in love with, like totally mm-hmm. falling in love with him. And so I got sober for a little while again, quit doing everything, quit messing around, like try to be the good <laughs> person, mm-hmm. right? You know, but I just, I just couldn't do it. Couldn't stay away from the cocaine, couldn't stay away from the alcohol. Mm-hmm. Um, so messed that up and, um, you know, just went on like this cycle of just like partying and, you know, just couldn't, it was like little periods of, yes, I can keep it together. And then little periods of like, things are way out of control. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I can relate to that. And then in the beginning, right, like in the beginning of addiction, you can manage it for a little while or you could stop for a little while. But at some point in time, there becomes a point where you just cannot function or control it or manage it anymore. Mm-hmm, absolutely. And that point truly came um, when I got pregnant with my daughter. And that was when shit got real. Mm -hmm. So I, um, me and baby daddy decided we're going to get back together. I had made another geographical change. (laughs) (laughs) And so me and him are going to get back together. We're going to do the right thing. We, we ended up renting a little house around the, around the corner from my mom. Um, and we're, we just get back together, you know, and this is not even six weeks. Bam. I'm pregnant with my daughter. Well, at the time I was waitressing at one of these uh, strip clubs out here in Atlanta and I had picked up this little Laura tab habit. Mm-hmm. No big deal. I wasn't, I wasn't doing anything else, right? Just taking a couple Laura tabs here and there on my shift while I'm waitressing. No big deal, right? No big deal until I tried to stop taking them right. <laughs> and found that, dang, like I can't stop taking these I feel like crap Mm -hmm. and um I remember the first time that I got sick I didn't know what happened I was like do I have the flu like what is wrong with me nobody told me hey if you (laughs) stop taking these you're gonna be sick you know so um I ended up staying on pills and 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 of course it doesn't it doesn't stay at lower tabs right it went from right (laughs) to percocets to oxycodone thirties, to oxys, Mm -hmm. to Dilata, to morphine, right? Everything. Um, and I am so I'm pregnant and I am filled with this terrifying fear and guilt and shame because I do not want to screw up another child. Like I want to do the right thing so badly. There is not a bone inside of me that, that doesn't want to do the right thing. But for some reason, because of this disease that we mm-hmm. have, I could not stop using. So yeah. I come clean to my OBGYN uh, at about seven months pregnant. They assure me that they're just going to, um, you know, put her in the NICU for about a week for surveillance. Everything will be fine. And that's not what happened at all. Mm-hmm. Um they ended up taking her from me right away. It was so traumatic. I mean, and I was truly ready to like be like done at this point, you know, um, there was no recovery coaching. There was no like encouragement, nothing like they were, you know, I had to go in the NICU and see her with all the NICU nurses looking at me, scowling at me with this like disgusted look, talking to me like shit, you know, um, it was terrible. And, uh, you know, so they ended up giving custody to my mom And so basically like, it was like, I wasn't even allowed to be in the same room as her. It was so traumatizing. Um, Shortly after that, I think I was, golly, maybe a week after my C-section, I'm like at, uh, at the house and I tried to eat a bottle of Klonopin. Um, It was really, really hard. And then, you know, things just really spiraled. Um, I ended up moving back in with my mom. My baby daddy ended up getting back on bad on heroin. I mean, it was just, it was such a shit show. And then when he left, it was like I had lost my child and I had lost my husband. Cause he's basically like my husband. I mean, we were together for like 10 years on and off, you know, um, in the same day. And I just lost it. And ended up just doing anything I could, whatever it was, give me more. Um, And I did try to go into like some detoxes. I went Mm -hmm. (laughs) into detox like eight different times, you know, (laughs) but uh, unfortunately, every time I would get out of detox, I would just think, oh, well, now I can get messed up like everybody else. We can do meth on the weekends, just like everyone else does. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, so that, that was very similar for me as well. I mean, once I lost my family, it was like nothing mattered anymore. You know, it just, it didn't matter what I had to do. I just wanted to be numb 
all the time because I just had so much shame and guilt and hate for myself, you know, and it really just, and it wasn't over yet, right? Like there were some years of that kind of shame and guilt and using and numbing your feelings before things got better. Is that what happened for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, when I ended up just getting involved with some really bad people, I was the, um, you know, the girl that the crack dealers would call at, you know what I mean? Midnight, you know what I mean? Hey, I'll give you an eight ball. You want to come over? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, so I, you know, I did that whole thing. Um, you know, I was, you know, basically just like my own escorting service, you know what I'm saying? Um, and just stayed messed up and changed the way I feel, changed the way I feel with sex, changed the way I, I was feeling with drugs, changed the way I was feeling with like escaping into this whole different crazy lifestyle, very dangerous lifestyle. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like the things that I did back then, like in this world today, I'm like, oh, oh no. <laughs> you would never see me again. The one person that would just take off with me, throw me in the in a ditch somewhere that'd be it I'm shocked I'm still here to tell my story honestly um (laughs) but yeah it it just what you know kept going like just spiraling out Mm. out of control and then I got involved with some you know really bad people who um we've done so many talks on you know this Mm -hmm. group of guys who um they were I don't know what they were the main guy was a Freemason they did magic, (laughs) weird Mm -hmm. snake charmers, whatever. Um, basically they like kept me in bondage with them for gosh, like almost three years. And so I remember like, you know, one time seeing my daughter and then I don't even know how long it was, but the next time I saw her, she was talking and I was like, Whoa, when did she start talking? You know? Cause I didn't even realize like how long I had been gone for, you know? Um, And of course there was some cycles of me like going to jail, but nothing ever like stuck, um, Mm -hmm. until the last time, um, the last time that I got arrested, I got arrested for a schedule one, two, three, four, and five, which is just like a little bit of everything. (laughs) It wasn't (laughs) like a lot, you know, the guy, the cops like, you know, what are you doing with all this? And I'm like, it's Tuesday, (laughs) like, like, you know, (laughs) whatever. And, um, yeah, and I didn't, I, I went, ended up like going to jail, but then I got out and I didn't have to serve those charges for years later. So it was still more years of craziness. Um, I ended up marrying this guy who was like a warlock who like made me try to believe he was Jesus. That was crazy. Um, <laughs> and his, his crazy family. Um, so that was really nuts. I was stuck with stuck in that whole mess for a little while. Um, but then when I finally, you know, when I got picked up, cause, cause of course I never showed up to court for my schedule one, two, three, four, and five, like they let me out and I was like, bye, <laughs> you know, um, catch me if you can. And, um, and they did <laughs> eventually a couple years later. And, um, that was in March of, uh, 2015 mm-hmm. and, Um, when I went to jail, you know, that last time it was so crazy because it was actually the same exact jail and the same number of days that I went to jail the very first time. Wow. There was the same freaking people in there that was in there in that (laughs) jail. The first time I went, it was the freakiest thing in the world. It was so freaky. Even this one girl from the first time I went, I remember she was sitting at this metal table and she looked at me and she said, Oh, you're Jamie, you're cookies friend. And I looked at her and I said, you said that to me last time I was here. <laughs> like that, it was, I mean, it was the trippiest thing. And I had this roommate and she said, she looked at me one day, you know, in there and she said to me, Jamie, sometimes you have to go through to get back to. And Mm -hmm. I was like, whoa, I am freaking out right now. Like, (laughs) all right, girl, well, let me get me out. Get me out of this circle. (laughs) Get me out of this cycle. (laughs) Like, I don't want to do this again. You know what I mean? Like, this is, it was like the sign of Jonah. You know what I mean? Lord's like, here you are again. What you going to do now? (laughs) Right. (laughs) And um, it was so freaky. I'll never forget it. And um, when I got out, you know, the, well, the judge, he said to me, okay, um, we're going to put you on a four-year felony probation. What that means is 
if you get in trouble or fail a drug test in the next four years, you're going to go to prison. Wow. And I looked at him and it just dawned on me, like something like clicked in my brain. I don't know how to do that. Mm-hmm. I can't do that. So I ended up getting out. And of course I tried to manipulate, find 500 different ways of how I could manage still using and being on this probation, which didn't work. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I finally surrendered and ended up going into a sober living facility in Athens, Georgia. And it it was like, when it, when it happened, when that moment of surrender happened, it was like every door closed except that one door to recovery. And it was just a straight shot. And I had even dreamed, it was so crazy because I had even dreamed about the place in jail When I got there, I was like, whoa, this is the place I dreamed about in jail. Like, so I knew I was in the right place. Mm -hmm. I knew I was exactly where I was supposed to be. Um, I didn't understand how it was going to work. Didn't understand what that looked like. But I knew for sure that I didn't want to go back to the things that I was doing before. I was Mm -hmm. tired of waking up every day pissed off that I woke up. I was tired of missing my children. I was tired of disappointing my family. And I just wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I call that the gift of desperation. Mm -hmm. Just so tired of the way that you were living and who that, who you were. And I love that you went to a sober living house and that you were willing to do that. And Mm -hmm. obviously had a little bit of hope that things could be different there. Oh yeah. I stayed there for three and a half years. They had, I didn't want to leave. (laughs) I didn't want to leave. I was lucky. It was like a, so I walked into this house with, um, 13 girls. Right. And when you first come in, it's the intake house, we call it the quad. And so, um, there's 13 other girls and I was so excited because for once I wasn't alone. I was surrounded Mm -hmm. by people who were trying to do the same thing I was trying to do. They were trying to get their kids back. They were trying to be better people. They were trying to be sober and, So, um, I remember, you know, walking in and seeing like, I had a bed, like a bed that was mine, that was safe, right? Like it, it, nobody could touch me. Nobody could do anything to me. Like it was a Mm -hmm. safe place. And there was, you know, I had a a half of a dresser, right? Like I had to share a dresser with a roommate, but I had half a dresser that I could put my clothes in. Like I didn't have to carry a garbage bag on my back anymore, full of my stuff. Mm -hmm. I had a half of a closet, I had a bathroom with a shower (laughs) and like I could, I could shower. There was a kitchen with food in it. (laughs) I mean, it was like, it was like heaven, you know, Mm -hmm. like it was like I had been walking around isolated, dying in the pits of hell. And finally, like I got to this place where it was peaceful and safe. And I was just like elated, you know, and I just, did whatever they said Mm because I didn't know any other way. And it was really hard at first. It was like super white knuckling. I would say like the first like two months, probably between step like two and three is when I really like calmed down. Um, But I was super mental health when I came in. I mean, I did not trust anybody. I didn't know if this place was real. I didn't know if these were paid actors. Like I was so messed up. Like I was like, and you know, it's kind of hard to believe like all these people are like sober and happy and smiling and laughing. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> like, <laughs> what's really going on? <laughs> yeah. I felt that way too. And just seeing people smiling and like having fun was so foreign to me because I had been in addiction for so long and it was so dark, you know, but that was really like one of the biggest moments for me was me laughing and feeling free. You know, I hadn't felt that way in so long. So I was so, you know, I, when I like something, I want more mm-hmm. <laughs> and I liked that. So I wanted more. And they told me I could get more by doing the things they suggested. So that's like what I did. Cause that's what I wanted was to be happy. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. That's what I did. I mean, and it was not easy, you know, and I would like to tell you that my bad habits just kind of dropped off when I walked in the sober living, but they didn't like wherever Jamie went, Jamie was still there. Right. Yeah. Um, So I was still in this mindset of having, you know, a bunch of different boyfriends and, and basically like dating, you know, guys for, you know, for them to help me pay my rent and stuff like that. But the people, but they caught on, you know what I mean? And, 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 you know, my roommates, 
um, were super helpful too. You know what I mean? Because that was like, kind of like the only thing that I knew, like, Oh, I have to have this guy because he's the one who gives me rides. I have to have this guy. Cause he's going to buy my cigarettes. Cause I just smoke at the time, you know, <clears throat> like, and you know, this, this roommate that I had, she heard me on the phone one time and, you know, it had been really starting to weigh on me. Like I, I didn't want to do it anymore. You know what I mean? Like I didn't, not like the guy was a bad guy, but I just, <laughs> I wanted to like, I had really started getting into like my relationship with God. And I really just, I, something inside of me was like, you have to change everything. Right. And so yeah. I remember talking to this guy on the phone and he was going to come pick me up and take me to do some errands and all this stuff. And, um, this, this lady, she said to me, she Hey sis, you know, you don't got to do that. Like I'll take you to run your errands. You mm -hmm. you don't have to do that. And I was like, what? <laughs> like you, you want to help me? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and I don't have to give you anything for it. You know, like that to me was the biggest mind blowing thing about people in recovery is like their willingness to help you just to help you. Yeah. And it really made me see that like there is people out here that are good, mm -hmm. that not everybody out here is trying to get you and use you and hurt you. Like there are really good people out here. And so, um, you know, that specific lady ended up taking me to a church and I ended up getting baptized mm -hmm. and it was, I'm telling you like that day that I got baptized, it was like everything changed everything. Mm -hmm. I went to a, um, an apostolic church and I had never been to an apostolic church before and they got down in worship, man. It was like a three hour <laughs> service. Um, <laughs> like they came and they laid their hands on me and prayed over me. And I'm telling you, it was this, um, this group, it was this, these older black women mm -hmm. and they put their hands on me and their eyes turned bright ice blue when they prayed over me. Wow. And you know, I just felt like the power of God, like come over me. They told me like that my face changed everything. Like they said, like they, they said, like the next time they saw me, like the next week in church, they said, I, they were, you look so much brighter. You look so different. You don't even know. And <clears throat> it was, it was crazy. So between, you know, getting, getting baptized and, you know, my, like fully surrendering into a relationship mm -hmm. with Jesus, who's my higher, higher power. Um, and like my step work and, and, and my step work, the reason that I love step work so much is because my step work actually bridged back my connection to God Yes, because I was able to get myself out of the way <clears throat> so that I could surrender to God so that I could be your will, not mine. Right. So that I could get all this yucky, dirty stuff out of the way so that I could say to God, God, I, I got these 60 pages of resentments here and every terrible thing that I've done. And I'm not sure how you feel about me. <laughs> like, I don't, Do you even really like me? Because according to your book, you about to send me to a real bad place. Right. <laughs> all these things. Right. So I, I'm real confused here. Like, can you help me help me with this? You know, and it wasn't until I could get all that yucky stuff out to have that clear connection to learn how to have a relationship with something higher than myself, greater than myself, was I able to like walk into my like my purpose and my passion and, and truly be able to like love people in recovery and like come to, um, you know, the things that I that were really important in my life, you know what I mean? Everything everything before that I thought was important really was not important. <laughs> yeah. So it was like a complete change of like everything. And it was through the 12 steps and, you know, and, and through my relationship with God. Yeah. That's awesome. And I don't know if we've ever talked about this before, but I just want to ask, like, at what point in time for you, did you learn that like your pain has become your purpose and start implementing that in your life. Cause I know you do a lot of service work and a lot of stuff for your community. Oh yeah. Um, I was 89 days sober and I started telling my story at the crisis intervention unit at advantage, which I now teach at. 
<laughs> so that's really cool. Um, but, and, oh, also <laughs> where I was a patient at, <laughs> so I was a patient there at the crisis unit. Um, <clears throat> and then at 89 days sober, I got to go in that same place where I was a patient at, you know, where you had the, the funny socks and no shoelaces, <laughs> you know, all that, all that deal. Um, I was in there twice. Um, I got to go into that same place and I got to tell my story. And when I told these people, which to me didn't seem like a lot, like that I had 89 days sober, their eyes lit up mm -hmm. and I knew there was something to me sharing my testimony of what God and recovery had done in my life. And when I saw there and when I saw in meetings, because, you know, a lot of people are scared to like speak in meetings, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, what I what I saw was that when I shared the things that I had been through, people were like, wow me too. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for saying that. And people come up to me after and say, thank you so much for saying that I've been struggling with this. And, and it was like, wow, there is something to speaking out about things. Like we are not perfect. So I don't know why we pr try to pretend we are like, <laughs> there's this beautiful song and it says, can't we all just be broken together? And when I found that we are just all broken people and we can just be broken together and hold space for each other and, and help each other to heal. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is when really I realized, you know, this is what I have been given. This is my assignment from yes. God. So, um, and for a while I didn't want to, I was ashamed. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll to be totally honest with you until I got certified with Georgia council on substance abuse as a, um, peer specialist for addictive disease and a recovery coach, I was still trying to sweep my recovery under the rug. Like, I just want to forget about all this and I want to just go and be a normal person. I don't want anyone to know. And it just hit me one day, you know, like, what are you so ashamed of? Mm -hmm. People have died <laughs> and you got to live. You have come through things that people could not make it through. And you were chosen to make it through these situations. You went from being homeless on the street, selling your mm -hmm. ass for $20 Roxy's, okay, <laughs> to having your own business, having your own house, having a relationship with your children, like being a leader in your community, certified with the Georgia Council on Substance Abuse. Whoa, who did that? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like you work in, you know, at the time I was a, a recovery coach for a nonprofit organization that helped women get out of human trafficking and prostitution. Like you mm. do all these things. Like I created a protocol for recovery massage so that people who are detoxing can have relief through massage. You know what I mean? Like I did all these things. Why am I trying to hide the fact that I am in recovery? Like, why mm. is it so bad, you know? And I was just like, it, it just dawned on me, you know what I mean? Like, man, I need to be proud of this. Like, mm -hmm. I need to, I need to tell mm. more people about the things that recovery and God has done in my life because people need to know about it. Cause I'm gonna tell you in 2014 and to, you know, before I came into sober living, I didn't know that there was a recovery community. I didn't know that there was a group of people who actually like helped you and gave a shit about you. Like, I didn't know that if I knew that I would have been in recovery long before, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that there was such a thing. So now it is my mission to let everybody know that recovery is real. Recovery is possible. Like recovery is not one way. <laughs> recovery is all inclusive and you can find your home. You can find love. You can find acceptance. You can find everything that you have been looking for in the community of recovery and in God. Yes. Amen. I love that. What a powerful testimony. I'm so glad that you came to do this with me today. So as maybe your last thoughts, what would you say 
to the girl or the guy who's maybe out there still using right now and doesn't know that there's another way or doesn't feel like they're worth it, what would you say to them? I would definitely say that I know you don't understand what's going on right now, but I promise you if you will just have a tiny, tiny mustard seed of faith that you will have a beautiful life. And this chapter that you're going through, it is just for a minute. It is just a season what you're going through. And when you come out on the other side of that, you are going to have such an amazing testimony and you are going to help so many people. You are going to wake up one day and you are going to be happy Mm -hmm. and you are going to wake up the next day and you're going to be happy again. (laughs) It is going to be amazing. And you are never going to ever want to go back to that place that you're at now. And I promise you for the moms out there, your children love you. Your children forgive you. They are not mad at you. They just want their mom or their dad back in their life. They just want them to be well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. And you are living proof of what you just said to wake up and be happy one day and be able to be there for your kids. I'm so glad that we did this today. So tell people where they can find you on YouTube and Facebook. Oh, you can find me Jamie Tall on every platform, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Um, definitely please subscribe to the YouTube follow. Um, I've got a couple different, um, platforms on Facebook. Um, so definitely, definitely follow me on there. Always putting out new videos. I am raw. I am real. I am honest. You, you may not want your kid to watch all my videos, (laughs) but I'm going to, I'm going to tell you exactly how it is. (laughs) All right. Thank you again so much for coming and doing this with me today, Jamie. And thank you guys for watching the hope shot. We will see you again soon.